back everyone if you're watching this on Moodle or later on YouTube um, if you have any comments and stuff like just ask them so so let's go back in history a little bit because hemp it's good to know what we kind of discovered in the last couple of hundred years and why we actually believe that this central dogma is true so the first guy is Friedrich Michener. So in 1868 um, he was doing um, research and Friedrich Michener was also in the DNA lecture of course. Um, so had the first thing that was discovered is that DNA and RNA um, have when they extracted the nuclein from the white blood cells they figured out that there are two types of different substances. So had we, they already knew that proteins existed, but besides the protein they extracted nuclein and then they figured out that there are different chemical properties to this nuclein. So which led to kind of the discovery that well there are two different types of nuclein within white blood cells. So this was, this, this was one of the big discoveries from Friedrich Michener and we will talk about the different chemical properties that they have. And then it is very quiet because RNA is a really difficult substance to work with because it hydrolyzes it very quickly, it breaks down very quickly and even nowadays when you work with RNA you have to work super super clean, right? So you have a clean bench, um, you have to get rid of all the RNAs, so the, the proteins that break down RNA um, because they are literally everywhere. But in 1959, eh, just more or less around the same time as the structure of DNA was um, was kind of um, in, well not invented because it's not an invention but when they figured out what the structure of DNA was they actually figured out also that messenger RNA carries information that directs protein synthesis. So this was discovered by Severo Ocha in 1950, 1959. So the, the discovery that messenger RNA so that RNA actually carries information and directs the synthesis of protein actually led to discovery of the ribosome. So the ribosome is this big more or less protein molecule which has not only proteins in there but also RNA and other things um, and had this ribosome um, makes new proteins for the cell and had this was discovered in more or less 1960 and in 1965 uh, we have Robert W. Holly which figured out that transfer RNAs are the physical link between RNA and proteins and we will be talking about transfer RNAs and transfer RNAs are kind of this it's this hybrid molecule which on the one side is an RNA molecule but on the other side it has uh, or it has a, an, an amino acid attached to it and this, this clover leaf structure with this amino acid allows the ribosome to synthesize any type of protein that it wants. So the first purification of RNA polymerase was done by Arthur Kronberg in 1957 and RNA polymerase is of course the thing that makes RNA from DNA. So hey, it's similar to the ribosome which transfers RNA into proteins. Um, RNA polymerase is the thing that binds the DNA and then moves along the DNA transcribing DNA into RNA. In 1983, the year that I was born, we have Karim Mullis who invented polymerase chain reaction which allowed us to look into the structure of DNA much more and also into the sequence of DNA um, because PCR is more or less the um, the method in molecular biology which made it possible to amplify DNA um, into large amounts so that we can really do something with it. So in 1989, so a couple of years later, um, the, the polymerase from thermophilic bacterium Therma aquaticus called TAC uh, was um, purified and this made it possible to do polymerase chain reaction much easier because for polymerase chain reaction you need different temperatures yeah, because it's a temperature cycle um, so you start off at a temperature where the DNA kind of opens up and then you have the protein the RNA polymerase binding to the DNA and then you have the transcription and all of these things work at different temperatures and the Thermos aquaticus is actually uh, an extremophile so it lives near these volcanic vents on the top of the uh, or on, on the top no, on the bottom of the ocean um, 
and there it it works under relatively high temperatures so this bacteria is able to survive temperatures of 90 100 degrees celsius and because of this uh, the polymerase that it has is very very stable so it doesn't easily break down and this was a major invention um, which allowed polymerase chain reaction to be used literally in every lab in the world and still polymer uh, the, still the thermos aquaticus polymerase is probably one of the proteins which is most sold in the history of molecular biology so in 1978 there is the um, there's the discovery which we already talked about that we have introns and we have exons right so that the the, the genetic the genetic code of the dna does not code one to one into rna um, but there are more or less gaps so there are sequences within the dna which are not transcribed in or which are transcribed into rna but the rna that is transcribed does not code for part of the protein so it has more or less a regulatory function then in uh, 1973, uh, we have the prediction that there is something at the end of the DNA, which is called a, a telomere. So at the end of the DNA, the DNA is, is kind of coated with a cap, and this cap protects it from chemical degradation. And because, of course, you can imagine that if you have a double helix, then the end of the double helix is more or less open. So, of course, all kinds of chemicals can come in and can more or less modify the DNA there so to prevent this at the end of the DNA you have these long caps called the telomeres so these are long stretches of A's and these stretches of A's need to be maintained and the maintenance of the ends of the DNA is done by telomerase so telomerase, uh, telomerase is a uh, protein which uses an RNA template to synthesize new DNA at the end of the pro uh, at the end of the DNA molecule, which keeps the DNA molecule stable. So, in 1984, we have the transposon discovery. Has so that the discovery that many mobile DNA elements use an RNA intermediate. So this RNA intermediate was discovered in like the 1985. So hey, we knew that there was something which is called transposons or jumping genes um, but this um, hey, but the fact that this uses RNA as an intermediate was discovered much later in the 1980s so and small RNA molecules regulate gene expression by post transcriptional gene silencing this is something that we will talk about in the rest of the lecture as well and but RNA itself is not without hey, RNA is not a dumb molecule which just transfers information from the cell nucleus into the cytosol where the ribosome makes proteins but rna itself also has a um, has a as a regulatory function so the cell uses rna to do things like counting how many proteins it makes but it also uses rna as as a feedback mechanism to silence genes um, which it does not need to express at that time so furthermore, we have non-coding RNA that controls epigenetic phenomena, um, which is called the, the tRNA, um, and also in 2010 by, or 2001 by Eddie, we have the epigenetic phenomena, which is the, which is the way that DNA is um, wound up and made inaccessible. So some parts of the DNA are open and can be used for protein production. Other parts of the DNA are not necessary, so they are more or less wound up. And so one of the things that is a very which is a very common thing which people always talk about is for example the silencing of the X chromosome in females. Females have two X chromosomes, but you don't in every cell one of the two is silenced and this happens very early in development so when you are still a blastocyst of like 16 to 32 cells at that point in each cell a decision is made that one of the two x chromosomes needs to be shut down and silenced because otherwise you would be producing twice the amount of protein right because you have two x chromosomes as a female a male only has one x chromosome and you only need one x chromosome to more or less make all of the proteins that you need so if you have two x chromosomes and both of these would be active that would be a massive issue because then you would have double the amount of proteins coming from the x chromosome um, so to prevent this at like a 16 to 32 cell stage when you're still a blastocyst um, the decision in each cell is made to silence one of the two. 
and this is at random and this causes all kinds of things that we kind of take for granted have for example in 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 um, in cats this leads to the fact that male cats only have two colors and female cats can actually have three colors because they have um, because the the x chromosome in cats encodes for the coat color um, and having two x chromosomes means that you can have two different coat colors um, as well as the the standard coat color coming from from the uh, from the autosomes and so that means that that female cats can have three types of color while male cats can only have two. So if you see a cat and this cat is multicolored, so it has three different hair colors, you can safely assume that this cat is a female cat. While a cat which has two colors can be a male or a female, but it has a higher likelihood of being a, a male because of the fact that females generally have three colors. And this, is, this has to do with the whole RNA silencing of the X chromosome. So a little bit of a look in DNA into detail. We know this already because we had the DNA lecture, right? So DNA has uh, thymine, adenine, uh, guanine, and cytosine, so GATC. Um, when we look at it in detail, we see that we have the sugar phosphate backbone. So we have phosphate molecules which couple the two oxygens together, which form the backbone. Of course, the backbone is also there at the other side. And what we can see is that the way that we have the group here, so the chemical group here, this is an, uh, an O minus group. So this is a slightly acidic group, right? So it loses an, a hydrogen. So it makes the water surrounding it a little bit more acidic. Um, and of course, we have hydrogen bonds, which keep the different base pairs together. So the thing to remember here is this, that if we have a, a GC pair, we have three hydrogen bonds, keeping them together while if we have an AT pair we only have two hydrogen bonds keeping them together which means that a GC pair binding in DNA is a stronger binding around 50% stronger than a binding which is an AT binding. So that is just something to remember about DNA um, and of course have you see the nice structure of the of the molecules as well. But and, so you have base pairs and you have the backbone. And why are we talking about the backbone and how DNA looks? Because if we compare DNA with RNA, and so on the one side here we see DNA, so the standard DNA molecule, we see the backbone which goes round, and we see the, the base pairs in the middle. And again, we see the different base pairs here. So the difference, the main difference between DNA and RNA is that DNA almost always comes in a double helix while RNA is almost always occurring in a singular helix. Actually within your cell you have protection mechanisms which detect double-stranded RNA and break it down immediately because double-stranded RNA is not used in eukaryotic cells it is only used by viruses and bacteria. So and for a, eukary uh, for a, a eukaryotic cell, it is very important to have single-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is directly degraded. And this is also where uh, RNA silencing comes in, right? Because RNA silencing is a small molecule RNA binding to a big messenger RNA. It forms like a double it forms a double helix in a way and then this is detected and is directly broken down by the cell because double-stranded RNA is very very dangerous. We can see here the different base pairs of the RNA molecule so had the first three base pairs are identical to the DNAs uh, the only difference is is that the T which is coded or so the, so the thymine base pair um, the thymine base pair is coded differently in RNA so in RNA we don't have a T but we have a U which is called uracil and this is slightly different so it, it is the same as the T but it doesn't have this uh, C3H group uh, CH3 group so it, it misses a, a side chain, which makes it a little bit different and also gives it some different chemical properties. So if we just summarize the differences between RNA and DNA, then the strandedness, well, RNA is almost always singly stranded, while DNA is almost always doubly stranded. The base pairs is, is that it contains a uracil versus DNA, which contains a thymine. The sugar backbone is a little bit different, so had the, the, the phosphate backbone um, is actually a, a so the, the sugar is, is in DNA, it's uh, 
deoxyribose and in, in RNA it's just ribose, so standard. Um, so RNA is much more reactive because of that. So if you look at the, the structure of the uh, of the of the this part here, right? So the, the, the sugar, right? So you have the, the base pair and then the sugar. And if you look at the, the, the structure of the sugar, then ribose has an additional OH group where deoxyribose doesn't have the OH group. And this means that it hydrolyzes much easier, so RNA has a much shorter lifetime than DNA. Another major difference is, is the size of the molecules. DNA molecules are big because they are, they are chromosomes, so they are massive structures, while the size of RNA is, is really relatively small compared to a DNA. So location-wise, the, um, the DNA is confined to the nucleus, so at least in... in, in in eukaryotic cells, right? In bacteria, this is not really the case. Um, but the RNA molecule is a molecule which is used for information transport. So it is created in the nucleus, but then moves or is moved to the cytoplasm. So it is it is not a stable molecule like DNA, which is more or less confined into the cell nucleus. RNA is a molecule which is created in the nucleus and then moves to the cytoplasm, where of course it is bound by the ribosome and then causes proteins to be made. All right, so different types of RNA. There are many, many different types of RNA. And RNA is one of these molecules where, and since it is a really difficult molecule to work with because it's not very stable, DNA, when you cool it, it can be stable for like hundreds of years. And have, in theory, we could even extract DNA from kind of dinosaur bones that we find. RNA is a molecule which has a very short lifetime. So it, it generally is made, translated, and then it breaks down. Because the molecule itself is not very stable because of the fact that it's just an intermediate. So different types of RNA that we will be talking about are messenger RNA. We already know a lot about messenger RNA, but I wanted to talk to you about the difference between HNRNA and mRNA. So messenger RNA is called mRNA, but messenger RNA is also called HNRNA. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the transfer RNAs, the tRNAs, which are used to synthesize proteins. We, for, uh, we also have ribosomal RNA, which is the RNA which is part of the ribosome. We have small nuclear RNAs called snRNAs, which are involved in splicing and other reactions. We have catalytic RNA, like the different ribozymes, or which are called ribozymes. And these are very interesting molecules because these are molecules that actually have an effector function and break down this biological dogma, right? So the biological dogma is DNA is the carrier of information, or, or DNA is storing the information, RNA is carrying the information and guiding protein synthesis, and proteins are the effector molecules. But that is not really true because RNA, are all, uh, RNA molecules can also be effector molecules. They can only also participate in chemical reactions and make things happen within the cell. I want to talk a little bit about microRNAs, I want to talk about small interfering RNAs, and I want to talk about non-coding RNAs, and these are all different types of RNAs. So hey, all of them, hey, and the way that we classify them, hey, it's all the same molecule, but they are different classes, so they have different, more or less, functions and different properties. So when we talk about messenger RNA, right, we say that messenger RNA is um, the carrier. So messenger RNA is made in the nucleus and then it is transported into the cytosol. Right, so the, when we talk about messenger RNA, we have to remember that when we talk about eukaryotic cells, messenger RNA comes with introns and exons, right? And only the exons code for protein. The introns are coding not for a protein, but are having generally regulatory functions, so they have to be removed from the final product, right? So, and what can happen is that different exons can be retained or skipped to produce different proteins from the same gene. So a single gene can sometimes produce like 20 different proteins, and this is because skipping an exon will leave out part of the protein, right? So the protein can be very long, but sometimes it's, it's a lot shorter. And so introns themselves are removed by the spliceosome complex. So the spliceosome complex is something which, which removes introns from pre-mRNA. So pre-mRNA is also called HNMRNA. 
So when when messenger RNA still has the introns, then it is called hnRNA instead of mRNA. So of course we need to get all of these introns out, which is done by the spliceosome. And after we have that, then we have mature mRNA, which is called messenger RNA and is coded as mRNA. And so we then call this an ORF. So the an ORF is the open reading frame, and the open reading frame is the uh, the, the genetic code. So three base pairs in the ORF code for a single amino acid. The next three base pairs code for the second amino acid. And then the base pairs uh, 7, 8 and 9, uh, they code for the third amino acid. So the ORF is uh, the sense making. Huh? So we go from something which has exons and introns to something which only has the exons. And now when the exons are more or less behind each other, then we call this part the coding sequence, the CDS. Furthermore, we have the untranslated regions, which are there both in the, the pre-mRNA, so the hnRNA, as well as in the mRNA. And these untranslated regions are important for the ribosome detecting the messenger RNA as being messenger RNA. So the UTRs are there to for the ribosome to recognize, oh, this is a messenger RNA that I can transform into a protein but they are also there to control the lifespan of the RNA, which means that if, if you have a long poly A tail, so if there's a lot of A's at the end, then every time that a protein is made, one of the A's is cut off. And when all of the A's are gone, like the, the, the telomeres at the, at the DNA level, right? So if the telomeres are gone, then the DNA breaks up and degrades. The same thing happens with RNA. So if all of the A's at the end of the messenger RNA are gone, then no more proteins are produced. So the ribosome has a head, so from a single messenger RNA, you can literally produce thousands of proteins. So of course, if you want to have a thousand proteins, then you're going to produce one messenger RNA with a long poly A tail. And every time that a protein is made, an A is cut off. And in the end, when all the A's are gone, then the RNA itself is degraded and protein production stops. So. The nice thing about the codon structure in, in messenger RNA is, is that it is very stable. It is stable across different species. And one of these things which is, which, which is more or less universal in all living things is that the start codon, so the beginning of the, the protein production, is always encoded by A, T, and G. And of course, A, T, and G that's not how you read it on the DNA, or on the messenger RNA because RNA does not have the T. So the start codon is actually when you look at when you look into the genome it says ATG, but if you look at the messenger RNA arriving at the ribosome uh, at the ribosome it is actually AUG for uh, uracil. There's also a, um, a stop codon so there's also a signal to the ribosome that you need to stop the protein at this point right because we need to start making the protein and then there needs to be a signal for the ribosome to stop and this this stop codon is um, more or less a, a, G, a degenerate codon um, because it can be a, a UAG, UAA or UGA um, and this is very species dependent so based on the stop codon being used you can more or less figure out if this is messenger RNA from a dog or if it's messenger RNA from a human yeah, because humans use a different stop codon than dogs uh, that might not be true but like you get the drift that the stop codon usage is dependent on the species that you're looking at. So UTRs, like I said, control the lifespan of the RNA, and this is generally done by the poly A tail. So the longer the, the tail, the more proteins will be produced from a single messenger RNA. All right, so that's everything that I wanted to say about hnRNA and mRNA. The next step, of course, is the transfer RNA. So transfer RNAs are 73 to 94 nucleotides long, and they are the physical link between the RNA sequence and the amino acid sequence produced by the protein. So what we see here is a standard clover leaf. That's how they call it. So the clover leaf has a, a very specific structure. So here at the top, the ACC um, with the OH group, this is the position where the amino acid is coupled to the tRNA. 
right? Because the tRNA is an RNA molecule, but at this position at the ACC, um, there is an amino acid coupled to this thing. So it's a hybrid. It's not pure RNA, it's RNA plus an amino acid. This is called the acceptor stem. So the acceptor stem is actually holding the um, amino acid. Then we have the D loop, which is important for the transition through the ribosome. And then we here have the anticodon loop, and the anticodon loop determines which base pair or which um, which amino acid is encoded by which three base pairs. So these three base pairs here in the anticodon loop, had the opposite base pairs are used. Eh? So when it binds the opposite base pairs, then there is a recognition, and then this recognition makes it so that the amino acid is incorporated into the protein. We then have the little variable loop here, and we have the, the T phi C loop, um, which are loops which are again important for the ribosome um, to recognize tRNAs and guide the tRNAs to the correct position so that it can synthesize uh, proteins. So how does this kind of work? So here we see a schematic, right? So in this case, the messenger RNA is entering the ribosome, so it is actually going from uh, this this side, so from left to right, um, and of course have, here we see the growing peptide chain. And so the first base pair is of course the the ATG uh, or AUG for the start, and then the next three base pairs will be bound by the tRNA. So here we see three A's um, on the messenger RNA, and of course three A's can be bound by UUU which is TTT, and then of course the UUU is carrying its own, um, uh, its own amino acid, right? So the amino acid is then, because the tRNA binds, the amino acid is then coupled to the protein, and then of course the next one. And in this structure you can see that this happens two at a time. So a ribosome has two tRNAs bound at the same time, and then when the next tRNA comes in, it pushes the last one out. So there's always two which are bound to the messenger RNA um, and had this synthesizes the peptide chain and it makes it so that had the, the messenger RNA structure is encoded into amino acids. So you can imagine that if there are mutations in your tRNA then this will have a massive effect on your proteins. Right? If you have a mutation in one of your tRNAs here, for example, your tRNA doesn't have an A here, but a, but a G, then all of a sudden, every amino acid is coded, or every, um, had this, this three base pair structure now produces a different amino acid. So, hey, instead of having a, a, a functional protein, um, you have a non-functional protein all of a sudden, because these, um, the, the, the link between the code in the DNA and the protein is broken. And this is why this, this, this is so, um, so uh, conserved across different species. Because mutations in tRNAs generally are directly lethal, because it, they just, instead of making a protein which goes alanine, valine, leucine, leucine, you now all of a sudden, instead of a leucine, put a completely different amino acid in. And that is why this structure is very, very stable and is more or less similar from like dinosaurs that lived 15 million years ago, as well as like humans who are living now. And the, the DNA genetic code is kept stable because of this fact that single mutations in the anticodon loop are directly causing the wrong, uh, the wrong amino acid to be incorporated. So if we look at the ribosome a little bit more in detail, then the ribosome of course translates mRNA to protein, and it does this, um, if we look, if we zoom in a little bit more, then you see here the A site, the P site, so the A site is the site where it enters, so again, or in this case the, the mRNA is pulled from left to right, um, and what we see is that tRNAs are more or less and tRNAs are brought to the ribosome, and then of course there is a matching of the tRNA to the um, to the to the messenger RNA, which happens in the A site. So in the A site, the tRNA still has the amino acid bound, and then it it does like a, a like a motor, like a two-stroke motor. It ticks every time. So hey, it, it ticks very quickly, and every time that it ticks, a new tRNA is is bound. 
the old one is expelled and the new one is uh, or the one that was at the first position goes to the second position and the, the amino acid is separated and bound to the uh, newly born protein. So the A site is for amino acyl, which is the binding site for the charged tRNA. The P site is the peptide site, which holds the tRNA, which is linked to the growing peptide chain. And then it, the last step, it is moved to the exit site, which is the final binding site for the tRNA before being pushed out of the ribosome by the next incoming tRNA. So it's like a two-stroke motor, so it continuously works and it continuously produces um, proteins by incorporating a new tRNA, the new tRNA pushes the chain forward and because it pushes the chain forward it also pushes the last one out. So heh, the ribosome always binds two tRNAs um, and heh, as soon as a new one comes in the, the old one more or less gets injected. So ribosomes contain RNA themselves because they need to recognize this these sites, right? Because for the, uh, the ATG um, there is a recognition pattern. So the ribosome needs to bind this AUG and needs to know, okay, so now I need to start producing uh, peptides. So now I need to start a new peptide chain. So a ribosome contains of different subunits. You have the large subunit and the small subunit, which together, coupled together, and then pull the RNA through it. And these subunits are named XX, so they have a number and then they have an S. And this S stands for the sedimentation speed. And this comes from way, way back when we were still classifying proteins based on how long it took for them to, when you put the protein into water, how long it took for it to kind of sediment out of the water. So to get like a little kind of stuff on the bottom, right? So S stands for sedimentation speed. So when we look at prokaryotes, we have a 23S large subunit, and then we have either a 5S small subunit or a 16S small subunit. In eukaryotes, it's a little bit different because we have a 28S big subunit, and then we have a 5.8, a 5, or an 18S small subunit, which is coupled to the lower part of the ribosome. So the ribosome is always made out of two proteins. It is not a single protein, it is two proteins. And not only is it two proteins, but it also contains RNA to do recognition of, of, of codons which are needed, like the, the start codon and the stop codon. Because they don't have tRNAs, right? There's no tRNA which has a start codon in there. Right, so the, the, um, the, uh, the RNA contained in the ribosome is there to recognize tRNAs and mRNA sequences which are needed. All right, so I wanted you guys to show you what uh, how it looks like because I always like looking at things uh, in protein so I wrote my own little 3d engine like years and years and years ago and like I love 3d programming because I'm I'm a visual person so I like looking at things um, and I just wanted to show you guys uh, a a small 3d visualization and this might actually crash the whole stream um, because the the computer program that I wrote is a little bit, well, it's not bad. It's it's actually pretty good, I think, um, but it, it uses up a lot of CPU and also GPU. So it might actually crash the whole stream, but we're just going to do it. So I'm just going to start up the program and I am then going to make it. Am I still there? I'm still there. I'm just seeing my CPU usage jump to like, 90%. So I'm just going to add a new window capture, um, which is actually this thing here. And we do OK. So this is then the really, really nice thing that I made. So for you guys to show, I will make it a little bit bigger. Um, I can't make it that much bigger, so I can make it a little bit bigger here. So this is the, the little 3D engine that I wrote. And the nice thing is, is that you can move around like this and you can load in different protein files, right? So what I did here is I took um, one of the, um, I, I took the large molecule. So this is the um, E. coli 23S molecule. Um, so every little dot that you see here is actually a molecule. 
and you see the amino acids in different colors. So the backbone is, um, let me see if I can zoom in and zoom out a little bit so I can move. So if we look and we zoom in, then here we see one of these amino acid chains, right? Because the ribosome is a protein itself, it is also made by the ribosomes. So hey, you see that there's of course like thousands and thousands of molecules. Let me look up. So here we are talking about uh, 147,000 atoms, so dots. Uh, we have in total 11,000 amino acids and these are coded in 57 peptide chains. So hey, there are 57 different proteins which come together to form one unit of the ribosome and in total we're talking about like around 11,000 amino acids which are used. So why do I got, want to show you guys this? Well I want to show you guys this because the ribosome itself has this big hole in there, right? So if you just move around you, you don't really see the hole but at it, depending on how you see the hole, right? And this is the hole where the messenger RNA is pulled through and of course this hole is covered by another, by the, by the small subunit. Um, but what I wanted to show you guys is how much RNA molecules are actually in the molecule itself. So you can see these really nice, and I don't know if it's very visible. Let me actually move a little bit and a little bit down. And here, because the, these are not amino acids, right? They're not having these little um, squares and triangles here, but you can see this more or less the RNA molecule very very as like a ghost image you can yeah it's probably not visible for you guys let me actually change the code a little bit um, so I can show you guys how I do this um, so let me go to notepad so I have here the PDB file which I load in and I can actually make the point size a little bit bigger so let's make it two and a half um, then execute the program again that will probably fill the whole screen It takes a little while. It's a, it's like a big molecule that needs to be loaded in. Okay, there we go. So it starts loading in the molecule. So I'm, I'm gone for a little bit because it covers me as well. Then we have the big protein here. And now we see all of these dots. And now you can relatively clearly see here on the bottom um, the nice kind of RNA structure, right? So you see this kind of half helix going into the ribosome. And hey, you can see here the, the, the RNA molecule combined with all of these tens of thousands of proteins. Um, so and it allows you to, the 3D engine allows you to zoom in and you can actually see this, this really nice like RNA structure. And this is, this is just an electron microscopy. Um, um, no, it's not an, it's a, it's an, uh, it's an X-ray microscopy um, image. So it's a crystal structure where you shoot an uh, X-ray to the crystal um, to kind of get the location of each of the atoms in the, in the file. And hey, the nice thing is, is that you can really clearly see this kind of RNA molecule coming in um, into the ribosome. And of course, hey, you see that these RNA molecules are more or less all around this hole where this, this, um, where the where the where the messenger RNA is pulled through. So just wanted to show you guys that this is also part of bioinformatics is writing like little programs which do 3D visualization to learn a little bit more about proteins. And so if you zoom out, you can see that this is a very, very kind of complex structure and that proteins are only a very minor part of the whole ribosome. Um, and so the, the proteins here are the ones which are coded with these little squares while all the other molecules which are part of the ribosome are there. And the ribosome is one of these fundamental proteins which um, without ribosomes like life would not be as complex as it is today. All right, so just as a little intermezzo. So. All right, so that, that's, I think, enough about the ribosome. So we know now how the ribosome works, that it's like a two-stroke engine where one of the tRNAs comes in, it pushes one out, and it grows this peptide chain. And the ribosome itself contains around, um, like, what did I say exactly? So it contains around, like, 60 different proteins, and these 60 different proteins are composed of, like, 11,000 amino acids. Good. So next type of RNA is small nuclear RNA, also called SNRNA. So 
I talked to you guys about messenger RNA and pre-messenger RNA and pre-messenger RNA actually needs to get rid of the exons uh, of the introns right because only the exons code for protein so um, the spliceosome is the protein which is responsible for this and also this protein needs to use RNA so we have ribosomal RNA which is RNA which is an integral part of the ribosome but also the spliceosome is a big protein and the big protein in the spliceosome contains five small nuclear RNAs called U1 to uh, U6 and we don't have a U3. I don't know exactly who named this but there are five different small RNAs which are part of the, the spliceosome. So these SNRNAs along with their associated proteins form the ribonucleoprotein complex SNRNPs which bind to specific sequences on the pre-mRNA. So hence small nuclear RNAs are found within the splicing speckles of the and cadial bodies of the cell nucleus so the splicing itself still happens within the cell nucleus so before the messenger RNA is transported out of the nucleus it first is transported to um, these little kind of areas of the cell nucleus because if you look at an electron microscopy photo of a, of a cell nucleus you see that there are these big holes where stuff gets transported in and out but besides these holes you see that there are all these little dots on the thing and these are all little structures where splicing takes place right so the small nuclear RNAs are processing pre-mRNA into mRNA so there are two ways or two ways that we know currently that this happens and there are that this is called U2 and U12 splicing so what happens is that these small nuclear RNAs are binding sequences on and so here we see an exon then we have a whole big intron and then we see the next exon and then what happens is that these small nuclear RNAs they recognize these sequences so AGG U R for um, uh, uh, for like an R is uh, encoding a multi-option, so that it doesn't have to be an A, a T, a G, or an U, um, but it, it, it needs to be a, a subset of them. And then here we see the branch side, and then we see the other part which is recognized, which is Y, A, G, G. So again, Y stands for two or three different amino uh, of uh, two or three different um, base pairs that can be there. So what happens is that a protein binds on the branching side, it, the protein binding uses RNA to bind there, then the 3' prime splice end and the 5' prime splice end is also bound by SNRNAs which then recruit proteins which then fold it together and then the, the RNA is cut and is glued together again to remove, um, the, um, to remove the intron from the messenger RNA. So this A here is the important part because that is what is kind of the, and so the sequence in the middle, the branch side, is the thing that is very important because that is the thing that is recognized. So if you have a mutation in your branch side, then again, what happens is, is that a um, protein is, uh, that, that the protein is unable to bind this exact sequence, which means that the, the removal of the intron fails, which means that a certain protein cannot be made. So that's what I kind of wanted to tell you about splicing. So splicing happens in something which is called splicing speckles and also cagel bodies. And these cagel bodies are around the pores which are in the cell nucleus. And these pores are important because there is where the stuff is transported in and out. Um, but around these pores you have a very specific amount of proteins which use RNA to, to modify RNA. And there are two types of splicing, U2, which recognizes AGG, it has a, just has a slightly different recognition side. Um, and, and now we can also see why there are five, right? Because here we have one, two, three, four, five, and these two are equal, um, which are recognized by five different small nuclear RNAs. So very important RNA molecules which are encoded in your genome and again also under heavy selection. So splicing is similar between humans, elephants, um, dinosaurs, uh, sharks and so because of this pressure because 
having mutations in these small nuclear RNAs means that splicing cannot take place, which means that in the end you are unable to produce the proteins that you need to survive. When we talk about snow RNAs, which are different from <laughs> SN RNAs, I know it's, it's, there's a lot of different RNA stuff going on, right? But small nuclear RNAs, S and O RNAs, play an essential role in RNA biogenesis. So they do chemical modification of ribosomal RNAs and of other RNA genes like tRNAs and SN RNAs. So SN RNAs are for splicing, small nuclear RNAs. Snow RNAs are small nucleolar RNAs. And these do conversion of, uh, uh, for example, uridin into pseudouridin. And what you can see here is that this is the standard uridin base pair, which is used in RNA, which is chemically modified into a different structure. And this chemically modification is necessary because RNA can have um, its, its own like um, enzymatic function. So RNA molecules can be uh, modified and one of the most well known of these small nucleolar RNAs is actually SNOW M1. So SNOW M1 is the molecule which transforms uridine into pseudouridine. And I don't know if you guys have been paying attention um, or not so much attention, but if you guys know that um, had the 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 BioNTech Pfizer vaccine which is made it is an mRNA vaccine, right? So it contains mRNA, which is then given to your cell in these little fat bubbles, which then guides the expression, or which then makes, which then tricks your ribosomes into making the spike protein. Also, in this, um, in this, in this mRNA vaccine, this chemical modification is done. So the, the chemical modification is done before you get the vaccine to turn all of the uridines in the messenger RNA into pseudouridines. And this is a very, very important step, which was discovered only like a few years ago, um, which actually makes it so that these mRNA vaccines actually work. Because if you give an mRNA vaccine, which contains uridine as the U base pair, then this is highly um, this is causing your immune system to react to the mRNA vaccine itself. So it starts attacking the mRNA molecule which you give to the cell. But you don't want that. You want the immune system to start attacking the protein that is actually encoded. So to prevent this, what you can do is you can take these uridine base pairs, use SNOW M1 or the, the protein, or the, the protein which actually is a small nuclear RNA, so it's a small RNA together with the protein which changes all of the uridines in the vaccine to pseudouridines, which now mean that your immune system will just allow the mRNA to go through. So it, it will reduce your initial reaction of your immune system to the mRNA itself. So a very important step. Um, SNOW M1 is actually everywhere. So, but where is this pseudouridine? It is found in transfer RNAs. So here you can see that in the, the T uh, phi C loop, um, you actually have this phi symbol. You also have a phi symbol here. And these are these pseudouridines. And pseudouridine is the most abundant RNA modification in, in cellular RNA. And that's why they actually have their own symbol. So if you think about RNA, then RNA molecules um, have always people say, well, we have um, A, C, G, and U, but that's not true because we have actually A, C, G, and U, and this phi residue, which is pseudouridine. It looks like uridine, your cell treats it like uridine, but chemically it is different. So it is more stable than the uridine, and it is less um, um, immunogenic. So a very important um, snow RNA is snow M1, uh, which transforms uridine into pseudouridine. Very important. All right, so small nucleolar RNAs. Again, all of these work in the nucleus. So one of the other uh, types of RNA is actually catalytic RNA, which is very, very important R uh, RNA, which is co uh, which have their own separate name. So generally people call them ribozyme. So have we, we, we generally treat proteins as being enzymes which participate in a chemical reaction, but they are not used. So they just um, 
they are there to, for example, make a chemical reaction easier. Um, so, but also RNA molecules can do that. RNA molecules are also catalytically active, so they, they can participate in a wide range of RNA processing reactions. So, for example, RNA splicing, all of these RNAs are also catalytic RNAs because they catalyze a chemical reaction themselves. Catalytic RNAs are also very important in viral replication and in tRNA biosynthesis, right? So an RNA molecule, when it's not an mRNA molecule, is not just a stupid molecule that just floats there and does nothing, like DNA. RNA molecules themselves are also effector molecules. So they have a very big role to play in cellular biochemistry. And of course, here, the structure of the RNA becomes very important because head the, like the structure of protein is very important for the function of the protein, the structure of catalytic RNA is very important for the functioning of the RNA itself. So there are different examples of ribozymes, like the hammerhead ribozyme, the VS and the leadzyme and the hairpin ribozyme. And so the hairpin ribozyme is the one that, that cuts the hairpin out of the uh, microRNAs. Um, but I don't want to go too much into detail about ribozymes. I just want you guys to know that there are ribonucleic acid enzymes so things which participate in a chemical reaction but are not used in they just catalyze so make the reaction run more efficient or make a reaction possible so ribozymes were discovered in 1982 um, and they are so rna can be both genetic material storing genetic material like mRNA similar to what DNA does but it is can also be biologically it can also be a biological catalyst so like a protein or an enzyme and this is why in 1982 after the discovery that ribo, uh, that RNA molecules can be both carrier of information as well as effector molecule the RNA world hypothesis was born. And the RNA world hypothesis state that before life existed on this planet, as we know it, all life was RNA life. So at, at a certain point in time, before we had proteins, before we had DNA, the only thing that we had was RNA molecules, which were kind of the only living thing. So RNA molecules, which would copy themselves and would then have kind of do their chemical function and had the idea is that um, um, that had RNA is at the basis of all life so had there was not like DNA or proteins which formed first no first RNA proteins formed and then RNA proteins actually started making uh, RNA molecules actually started making proteins they actually started making DNA to kind of um, extend their own lifespan. Since RNA has a very short lifespan, hey, you can think of an RNA creature which lives, like, vi like an RNA virus which uses RNA molecules. Hey, but the RNA world hypothesis is that hey, before DNA, before proteins, all living creatures on the world, or at least on our planet, consisted of nothing but RNA. Um, and in 1989, Thomas Cech and Sidney Altman actually get, got a Nobel Prize for Chemistry for discovering the catalytic properties of RNA. So and we know now that RNA molecules can have their own, um, F, uh, can be their own proteins or enzymes. They can act as a protein or an enzyme. And there are actually some really funny online tools where you can play with, um, where you can um, kind of simulate different RNA molecules in competition with each other and you can actually see RNA molecules copying themselves and evolving themselves. So hey, you can actually make an RNA molecule which makes a copy of itself out of nothing um, hey, just by binding um, um, base pairs complementary. All right, one of the last types of RNA are small uh, or micro RNAs or small interfering RNAs and as small uh, RNA molecules are termed microRNAs and small interfering are abundant in uh, eukaryotic cells. So microRNAs and small interfering RNAs are slightly different, but for this lecture we will just group them into one. Um, hey, they are abundant in uh, eukaryotic cells and what they do is they do post-translational control over our mRNA expression. So they exert their function by binding to a specific site within the messenger RNA and introducing cleavage of the mRNA via a specific silencing associated RNA degradation pathway. So how does this happen? Well, 
I told you guys at the beginning that RNA is always single stranded for eukaryotic uh, for uh, for um, eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells, when they detect um, uh, when they detect uh, uh, double stranded RNA, it is directly degraded. There is a whole pathway uh, in the cell that just does nothing but de degradate double stranded RNA. So the cell also uses this to control. So imagine that like the temperature goes up. So a certain heat shock protein needs to be produced to protect yourself from this increase in heat. So the cell will start producing this messenger RNA. But producing a messenger RNA takes some time. Um, so hey, it will take some time for the messenger RNA to be made. Then it needs to be spliced and then it needs to be made. It needs to be transported into the cytosol into the ribosome so all of these processes take time but in the meantime right the the, the transcription machinery has started and blah and has, so it's already busy producing mRNA but the temperature now has gone down so what the cell can then do it can make these small micro RNAs which then bind the just recently created mRNA and have it degraded very very quickly so hey, in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a very fast way of controlling the production of proteins, or not so much controlling the production of proteins, but shutting down the production of proteins before the cell even starts making them. So it's kind of an interference mechanism saying that, oh, well, we needed proteins like five minutes ago, but they're not needed anymore, so quit making them, uh, or don't even make them. And what the cell does, it makes this microRNA, it binds the mRNA, and then the whole thing is degraded because double-stranded RNA is just bad for uh, uh, eukaryotic cells. So microRNAs are 21 to 22 nucleotides. They are processed from hairpin RNAs encoded by cellular DNA. They regulate the gene expression primarily by inhibiting translation and promoting mRNA degradation. So they bind the mRNA, um, it, it hits the, the ribosome, the ribosome kind of clogs up and stops making proteins and then the whole thing is kind of pulled out and degraded because it's, um, um, it, it's not needed anymore. So in total, there are around 250 to 350 microRNA genes, which are encoded in the human genome. So they are, they are very abundant and they are produced regularly frequent, especially when situations change very quickly. And have, for example, also in the regulation of like uh, neurons and synaptic communication, they are very important because also there you can't take 15 minutes to start producing a protein to have something being done um, when you're talking, right? So when you're talking, you need to have very fast control and this fast control is, is done by microRNA genes. So how does this look? So you have your cellular gene, which then forms these pre-microRNAs. The, you have the drosia protein, which then cuts off the, uh, the like edges, you get this little hairpin, and then you have dicer, which splits the hairpin or cuts off the hairpin. Now you have two um, microRNA molecules, which are more or less complementary. Um, they are like separated from each other, and then hey, what happens is this: that the mature microRNA is then transported into the cytosol, and what it does when it is exactly complementary to the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA is, is degraded, but if it's not entirely complementary then hey, it still binds the messenger RNA but the messenger RNA is now unable to be transcribed into the ribosome because of the double strandedness and of course after inhibition it is also degraded all right so last type of RNA is non-coding RNA and of course all of these types of RNA that we have seen except for messenger RNA are non-coding RNAs right long non-coding RNAs also exist so they're not all very small yeah? so like the, the, the snow RNAs or the micro RNAs or the short RNAs they are all very small they are like 100 200 base pairs max we also have very long RNAs which are not coding for a protein which can be lo even longer than micro RNAs and had they they have been found in our not so much found, but they are there to do genome defense and chromosome inactivation. So had the, most, the two most well-known 
long non-coding RNAs are pi RNAs which prevent genome instability in the germline so they are there to make sure that the, the genome is stable had that telomeres or the telomeres are put onto the edges of the chromosomes um, and on the other hand we have uh, exist uh, which is the X chromosome inactivation in mammals so this is a, a single long non-coding RNA that when it binds one of the X chromosomes it causes the X chromosome to kind of shrivel up and be completely inaccessible for expression and as soon as it binds one of the two X chromosomes then the other X chromosome will will still be active so and this is a kind of funny image where it says I can't find the open reading frame could it be a non-coding RNA so hey, when you find an open reading frame so an ORF then you know you're looking at a messenger RNA um, because it codes for a protein um, but all of the other types of RNA they don't code for protein they are more or less ribozymes so they have their own catalytic function um, and their own more or less place in cellular regulation so long non-coding RNAs are modular so if you look at long non-coding RNAs, they have different functional domains and they are more or less like Lego put together by the cell. So you can have a, so for example, you can have a, a region of the, of the non-coding RNA, which is RNA binding. You can have things which, are, which bind proteins. You can have things which bind DNA. You can have conformational switches, so which kind of move... Um, like a and like a like a ribosome uh, like a like the ribosome which which moves um, and have based on temperature or based on the um, existence of like um, iron or other molecules um, but all of these are more or less modular so if you if you have on the one axis um, the different types of, of long non-coding uh, RNAs and on the top you have all of these different functions and then some of them are RNA binding and protein binding others are RNA binding, protein binding and bind DNA um, this one does something else, right? so they are, they are modular so like Lego they can be connected together by the cell to produce an, a non-coding RNA which has a very specific function Okay, so those are all the different types of RNA. I don't like it either. I like I I when I got the course, I first saw the RNA lecture and I thought like, oh my god, there's so many different types of RNA and like it's just gonna like put everyone to sleep. Um, and it does. It it is, but it is important to know that there are all of these different types of RNA um, because. When you do um, structure prediction of RNA, you have to be aware of the fact that something can be long non-coding or it can be a microRNA. And they are very important in the regulation of genes. And that is the, the way that we are interested in, right? Because as a bioinformatician, you're interested in how the DNA sequence causes RNA to be trans uh, causes messenger RNA to be made and causes proteins to be produced right that's the biological dogma we are interested in things like disease uh, how does how, why do some people get sick and others don't and so we have to kind of understand how um, messenger RNA um, is is made and how it's regulated and then how this leads to protein production and because some proteins can make you sick and other proteins can help you defend against disease. Alright, so mRNA expression is the thing that we are interested in. Well, not directly mRNA, we are interested in disease, right? But to understand disease we need to know which proteins we need to make to prevent us from getting sick. Um, and these proteins are of course made by messenger RNA, so we need to understand how the genome or how, how a cell decides which mRNA to make. Um, yeah, so which parts of the genome are active, which parts of the genome are inactive. So we have what we generally do in bioinformatics is measure and compare RNA expression between disease tissue and healthy tissue. And so we estimate the environmental or genetic effects on, on phenotypes that we're interested in. And so for example, we can be interested in cancer. And so then we look at how a cancer cell is, a, is, is expressing its genome versus how a healthy cell is expressing it in, in its genome. Because when we find differences in expression, and then that generally allows us to explain or reason about why there are differences in phenotypes. 
So when we talk about mRNA expression, there are three different ways to measure mRNA expression currently. One of them is quantitative real-time PCR, which is, for example, also used to detect, um, well, if you have um, SARS, um, or if you have influenza A or influenza B. Um, there are ways to measure it whole genome, so we can use microarrays to measure 20, 30,000 genes at the same time, and we can use RNA sequencing as well, and RNA sequencing also allows us to get the expression of the messenger RNA. Not only that, but it also allows us to look at like post-translational modifications, right? If something is a uh, uracil or a pseudouracil, right, which can be very important for the cell. Good, so I will pause here and we will do another 10 minute break. Um, so I will see you guys in 10 minutes and then we will be talking more about mRNA expression and how we can measure it and um, how bioinformatics plays a role there. Good, so the next break, I don't know what it's going to be. What did we have in the oh, well, last break was koalas. I don't know. So you will just have to find out. So I will stop.